So hello everyone, welcome back. So today's problem is also from electrostatic. Okay, so this is a ability understanding question number three from the book Pathfinder. So in this question, we have two beads who, uh, with equal mass and unlike charges of modulus Q1 and Q2, and they can slide on fixed frictionless non-conducting rod that are bent at right angles. Initially, the beads are held at rest at distances of D and 2D from the corner, and then they are released simultaneously. Okay, and the question is when one of the beads reaches the corner, where will the other bead be? We have to treat the beads as point particles. Okay, so this is the initial configuration uh, of the system. So basically the electrostatic force of attraction will be along the line joining them. So on this Q1, it will be in this direction. Let's say its magnitude is F and on Q2, it will be in this direction. And uh, the other force is just the normal reaction force from the rods on the charges. Okay, and we don't really have to care about that because in that direction, forces are balanced anyway. So we just have to look at the forces along the rod. So, so let's just say this angle is theta. So the force on charge Q1 along the rod is going to be F cos theta. From here, we can just directly write the acceleration of charge Q1 as F cos theta by M towards the right direction. As this is a right angle over here, the force of charge q2 along this rod is going to be f sine theta okay and therefore we can write a2 as f sine theta by m in the downward direction so if you take the ratio of these two quantities so that is a1 over a2 this turns out to be cot theta and cot theta from this triangle is just going to be 2 so this is going to be 2 okay in the initial instant at least the acceleration of the particle 1 is double that of acceleration of particle 2 in terms of magnitude Okay, so now I'm going to erase most of the stuff here. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is write down this distance as, um, let's say, x1 and this distance as some x2. Okay, this is to avoid any confusion with the symbols. Okay, so now from the acceleration ratio, it is clear that the acceleration of charge Q2, if we take it to be A for a second, then the acceleration of charge Q1 will be 2A at this particular instant. Okay, so just at the start. So if the acceleration ratios are 2 is to 1, then the displacement ratios will be also 2 is to 1 if we consider a small displacement. So let's just consider a small displacement. So I'm just exaggerating it. So as it is x2, it's small decrement. I'm taking it as delta x2. And for the charge q1, I'm taking the small decrement in the length x1 as delta x1. So as I know that the acceleration ratios are in the ratio 2 is to 1, the ratio delta x1 by delta x2, which is the displacement ratio, this will also be 2 is to 1. Okay, this is because um, you can take the example of dropping two balls from rest and, and one ball is being accelerated at twice the rate. So its displacement after a small time delta t will be proportional to half a delta t squared. So it's proportional to the acceleration term, right? So the the, the key, the important fact here is that, guys, uh, delta x1 and delta x2 are very small displacements, okay? So, they're so small to the point that we can consider the accelerations of the individual particles to be roughly constant, okay? So, now the new distance of charge q1 from the origin is x1 minus delta x1. And similarly, the new distance of charge q2 is x2 minus delta x2. Okay, so now the as the distances have changed the acceleration ratios will also change, right? So the new acceleration ratio, let's call it A1 dash upon A2 dash, similar to how we calculated earlier, be proportional to cot of theta, right? And cot of theta will be x1 minus delta x1 divided by x2 minus delta x2. So now the thing is that this can be simplified a bit. So if I keep the x1 terms as such, remember guys, uh, the value of x2 is equal to d and the value of x1 is equal to 2d, right? So x2 is just going to be x1 by 2 and delta x2 is just delta x1 by 2 from this relation. So from here, what we are getting is that the new acceleration ratio is once again equal to 2. Okay, so now by using the same arguments we used earlier, if I say q2 move down by an amount of delta x2, once again, the charge q1 will move towards the right by an amount of delta x1. Okay, so let's say the charge q2 reaches the origin after n such steps. So basically after n steps of delta x2, it reached the origin, which means the length is just equal to d, right? So if you guys remember, this length was equal to d. So n times delta x2 will be just d. So in the same n steps, 
the charge Q1 will move forward by an amount of n times delta X1. Okay, and delta X1 is just double delta X2. So this is just 2n delta X1, which is just 2d. I mean, simply speaking, these arrows, so there are n such arrows here, and there are n such arrows here. But the difference is that here, the each arrow has double the length, which means Q1 will cover double the distance, basically. So as Q2 covered a distance of d, Q1 covered a distance of 2D and they will simultaneously reach the origin. So that was basically the question. Now you may have a doubt. How did I just say that delta X1 by delta X2 is going to be 2 for all such delta X1s? So that we can just prove quick. So let's just take some random point. I'm just going to mark it as X. And let's say at this instant, the other charge is somewhere over here. Okay. And at this point, the charge Q1 will have some velocity. And the charge Q2 will also have some velocity. Once again, let's just consider a displacement of delta X1 here. Here, I'm going to consider a displacement of delta X2. I want the value of delta X2. We can use the S equals UT plus half AT squared formula. We can use that because in this tiny interval, we can consider the acceleration to be constant. So the displacement will be equal to the velocity multiplied by the time. So I'm just considering some small time delta T plus half the acceleration times delta t squared. Okay, so this will be a2. Now, uh, a2 is going to be the acceleration at this particular point. Okay, so it's not the same a2 as the starting acceleration. It is the acceleration at this point. Okay, so now for delta x1, this would be equal to, now guys, v1 is just going to be twice v2. Okay, so I'll I'll explain how in a bit. So, so basically what I'm saying is that the velocity of uh, q1 at this instant is double the velocity of q2 at this instant so i'll explain why in a bit and this plus half a1 now the acceleration ratios will be 2 is to 1 at each step right so this is just going to be 2a1 times delta t squared so this if you observe is just twice of delta x2 okay so basically whatever intermediate step you consider the infinitesimal displacement ratios will always be 2 is to 1 now why is uh, v1 double the velocity v2 so i mean that we can just simply uh, explain using the acceleration logic so the acceleration ratio we know it is always equal to 2 is to 1 now acceleration is essentially how much the velocity changes in a given time interval right so we can say that a2 by a1 is the same as delta v2 by delta v1 Okay, so uh, now we can just uh, use simple ratio and proportions to prove it. Okay, so let's say if this is charge Q2 and this is charge Q1. Starting from t equal to 0, uh, we'll just consider the st steps of delta t. So at t equal to 0, both velocities are 0. And at t equal to, after t equal to delta t, the velocity of charge Q2 will be a2 delta t, right? V equal to u plus at, that basically. So this is going to be a2 delta t. And this will be equal to a1 delta t. Okay, so now this is clearly twice this, right? So we can see the two is to one ratio. So if I say this is equal to V, this will be equal to two V basically. So after the next delta T seconds, it will be A2 dash delta T. And here it will be two V plus A1 dash delta T. And once again, A1 dash is double the value of A2 dash. Okay, so once again, we can see the two is to one ratio. So if I say this is V dash, this will be 2v dash. So yeah, that's basically it. The rest of the thing I just did for like a formal proof, but all you needed to observe was that the displacement ratio is just 2 is to 1. The ratio of delta x1 by delta x2 is 2. And after that, it's basically done. Okay. Okay. So another way to uh, look at this problem is something like this. So let's say if we have charges q1 and q2, something like this. So the trick now is to just observe the line connecting q1 and q2. So uh, once again, using the delta x1 by delta x2 equals 2 fact, I'm just, if I consider q2 to move down by, let's say some distance, uh, some delta, then q1 will move towards the right by an amount of 2 delta. So now the trick is that line connecting, the new line connecting is going to be parallel to the original line. So I mean, the reason is pretty obvious. It's because the slopes are equal. So if you observe, let's say for the first line, this angle is theta. So tan theta is just equal to half because the vertical length was D and the horizontal length was 2D. So tan theta is just half. So now if let's say this angle is theta dash, the angle, so the term tan theta dash D minus delta divided by 2d minus 2 delta. So this is once again equal to half. So theta dash is just the same as theta or these two lines are parallel. So basically the um, 
basically the motion will be something like this so the line connecting them will always be parallel so eventually they'll both meet at the origin at the same time so so yeah i mean this is basically exactly what the previous method is but uh, another way to look at this would be to draw a median from the right angled vertex to this right triangle so basically if you consider this as a right triangle if you draw the median to the hypotenuse then what the what that will do is it will bisect this line now this will be the median to this triangle this will be the median to this triangle this will be the median of this triangle so it will basically bisect all these right triangles so what we can see from here is that this is also the center of mass right so the center of mass is basically the at the middle because because both the charges have the same mass so this is also the center of mass so basically the center of mass as you can see it moves along the yellow line like this okay so we, you can also relate it to the acceleration of the center of mass so to figure it out all you have to do is all you have to do is figure out f net over the total mass and you'll get the center of mass's acceleration uh, and from that term you can figure out the direction of the acm using the f net equal to ma term you'll figure out the direction of acm so basically the direction of this pink line after that um, you can you'll make the observation that the pink line will eventually intersect the origin which means the center of mass will eventually reach the origin and there is only one possibility in which that happens and that is if q1 and q2 both reach the origin simultaneously that's the only situation where the center of mass is at the origin that is about it for this question now let's move on to the next question okay so now the second question is this is from the optics chapter and this is the second challenge understanding question so in this question we have a laser beam that propagates through a spherically symmetric medium surrounding a metal sphere whose radius is 10 cm so this is the metal sphere and its radius is capital r and the refractive index of the medium varies with the distance r from the center o of the sphere according to the law mu is proportional to small r so firstly the refractive index only varies with the radial distance from o so if you imagine a very thin sphere at a radius of r and a and with a very tiny thickness of dr everywhere on the sphere the refractive index is going to be a constant okay so basically the further we move away from the origin the more the refractive index will grow now i don't understand the significance of the double less than sign here i think this should just be less than because it's not extremely capital r and the small r's that we are going to be dealing with is comparable so and then the laser beam makes an angle of 30 degrees with a radial line at point p so uh, so at this point p if i draw a radius line the tangent to the light ray at this point p will make an angle theta which is 30 degrees and the value of r naught is given to be 50 root 3 centimeters uh, away from the point o now the question is what is the minimum distance of from the surface of the sphere that the beam can reach so this beam will have a trajectory something like this so they're asking us about the what is the minimum distance of this beam from the surface of the sphere so that's what they are asking so first of all i'm gonna use a result which i proved a few videos ago so uh, consider a spherical region whose radius is r1 and another region whose radius is r2 okay so now i'm going to consider that the refractive index of the outside is mu1 the refractive index of this part is mu2 and the refractive index of this part uh, is mu3 but that's not needed here now if we consider a ray of light so let's say inter it intercepts at this point so now it's going to get refracted and now it is intercepted at this particular point okay so now if we draw normals to these points so this is the second point and this is the first point and if the angle of incidence at this location is theta 1 and the angle of incidence to the next layer is going to be theta 2 then the way we relate theta 1 to theta 2 is using the relation that okay so let's just consider the outer radius to be r1 so that there will be a uniformity of the subscript numbers so yeah the relation basically is mu1 r1 sine of theta 1 is mu2 r2 sine of theta 2 basically we equate the value of mu r sine theta at the two locations so so at the first location the angle of incidence is theta 1 and the radial distance is r1 and the refractive index in this region is mu1 so that's why mu1 r1 sine theta1 and and similar arguments can be made for the second point okay and this is how we relate the sine theta so the way we prove this is using snell's law and just simple sine rule okay so now if you take another spherical shell somewhere over here and if the radius and if the refractive index over here is mu3 and the radius is r3 and let's say the normal makes an angle of theta3 then this will also be equal to mu3 r3 sine of theta3 so you guys get the idea right so if we 
have a varying refractive index in a spherically symmetric media, which means um, refractive index only varies with small r, then we can say that mu r sin theta is a constant for the light ray. So now if we know this result, then this question is... Um, it's just very easy. So so now as we know, mu r sin theta is a constant and uh, in the current problem, mu is proportional to r, then we can say r square sin theta is going to be a constant for the current light ray. So let's say we extend the light ray a little bit. Now the minimum distance is obviously going to be along the common normal. So it'll be, so this looks like the common normal. So if I draw a tangent somewhere over here, this angle will also be 90. This is going to be the minimum distance from the surface of the sphere. Okay, so now all we have to do is apply this particular relation. So at this point P, the radial line makes an angle of theta and its radial distance is R0. So we can say R0 square sine theta. And our second point of interest will be this point. Let's call it as point X. So at point X, the radial distance from point O, I'm just going to call it as small r. Okay, so this will be equal to R square. And the radial line makes an angle 90 degree with the tangent to the light ray at this point. So this will be sine of 90. So R0 square is 50 square times 2. Sine 30 is half. So R will just be 50 centimeters. Okay, so, so as R is 50 centimeters, we wanted the distance from the surface of the sphere. So that distance, let's say it is R dash. Um, it will be R and we'll just subtract the radius of the sphere. So this will be 50 minus 10, which is... 40 centimeters. So this is the answer. So this distance is just going to be 40. So this was the question. So yeah, that was it for this video, guys. If you have any doubts, you can ask below. And if you enjoy the video, make sure to like, share and subscribe. And that's it. Thanks for watching.